Historically, from the beginning, men have been the leaders and builders. And men have been the writers of history, his story. Men have been the leaders and builders in Tualatin. John Sweek, Ed Byram, John Nyberg, Joseph Galbraith, John L. Smith, they all seem to be named John. But the men have been builders and leaders too, in their own special way. Women who saw a need in the community and went about doing something about it. They saw a need and they filled that need. That's making Tualatin a better community. So today, rather than history, his story, we bring you her story. Now, Maria Sweek came across the plains in 1852 in a covered wagon, and she was a young bride. Maria, tell us of your dreams when you got to Tualatin. Well, Mr. Sweek and I arrived here in 1852. We built our little log cabin just like everybody else, one room. But I made a vow that someday we would build a fine home like the one I had grown up in in St. Genevieve, Missouri. Now, Mr. Sweek is an enterprising man. He even followed the men going off to work in the Idaho mines and hauled up the provisions they would need, trip after trip, to restock. And he did very well when the miners did well. And when the railroad came through our claim, claim he plowed the village and named it Tualatin. Soon it had one store, one church, one hotel, and more importantly, two saloons. <laughs> so now, Mr. Sweet, we did have some money, but we had several babies, and we really did need more room. And with a forest of trees on our claim and a sawmill nearby, we soon had plenty of boards to start building a proper home. But we built it in stages. A two-story house, we finished the downstairs first, and left the upstairs into one big room to be built out into separate rooms later. But that one big room gave me an idea. Before we added the walls, we could use that room as a ballroom. And so we did. I invited folks from all over. We even hired a fiddle, and we would dance the night away. Some of the people would even stay overnight. It was just too cold and snowy to go back to their own homes. Now, when you build a house here, it's very sure to see that there's no shortage of lumber. But getting window panes for the 53 windows in our new home, that was another matter. We had to order rolled glass to be shipped from the East Coast all around Cape Horn. When the house was finally done, the first floor had two parlors, a dining room, a kitchen, a pantry, a washroom, and a wood room, and the second floor, the nursery and the bedrooms. Fifteen rooms in all, heated with five fireplaces. We named our beautiful home Willowbrook, and now we really were ready to entertain. I have to laugh now when I think of the dances we held in that barren upstairs room compared to the elegant Christmas party we held in 1870. The invitation, I, I have one here. We had them printed all the way up in Portland. Um, it reads, Christmas party. Then there was a line where we would insert the, the folks' names, and it would say, Yourself and lady are respectfully invited to attend a Christmas party at the residence of John Sweek on Friday evening, December 23rd, 1870. That was a beautiful party, the first of many. And over the years, we had many prominent guests stay in our home. I like to think Mr. Sweek and I add a little touch of elegance to this new little community. You certainly did, Maria. And now your beautiful home is on the National Registry of Historic Places. And that invitation? One of them recently turned up in an antique shop in Sherwood. And now it's back in the Sweek house. Lizzie Smith, Robinson Jones, tell us all about what happened when your family hit Tualatin. Well, Tualatin was just a one-horse town with a railroad running through it. We got here in 1892, but it didn't stay that way for long. The whole Smith family settled here, all 11 of us, parents, siblings, and my husband, Newt Johnson. Newt J Robinson, excuse me. I'm <laughs> jumping ahead here. And me. Brother John was the powerhouse. He set up a sawmill, started logging operation, even built a boarding house for his workers, and he incorporated the business. We had the first payroll in the area. We got prosperous. We built nice houses for ourselves, built them side by side along Tualatin Road and east along Boone's Ferry. 
Mine is the one with the corner tower and the picket fence. There was a store, a hotel, and a couple of saloons over by the railroad. But John L. built a big store on the corner of Boone's Ferry Road, a fancy one with a turret for Newt and me to run. We called it Robinson's Store. Then when the Oregon Electric came through in 1906, it ran right in front of our sawmill and our houses and our store. And they put the depot south in front of your place, Maria. We were now the center of town. But John L. had great plans for building a fine brick store, using bricks from our own brickyard. Then tragedy. The fellows were running a big logging operation a couple of miles west when a cable snapped. It hit him. It was terrible, terrible. He was just in his prime. But Newt and I went ahead with his plan. We moved the wooden store over and made it the feed store. And in 1912, we built the brick store, Robinson's Brick Store. When it opened, we gave out fancy calendar plates to all of our customers. When Newt died, he left me well off. Now, I own most of the property around town. <laughs> People say that whatever I don't own, John Wish holds the mortgage on. Well, I make it my business to keep the town up to snuff. I've headed up some organizations, and I write for the local newspaper. And I want to keep people informed, you know. We made money, but we were generous, too. Donated land for the new Methodist Church in 1925, and gave up land for the VFW Hall, the Quonset Building, the vets put up in 1952. <coughs> Can I tell you something funny? Sometime after Newt passed away, Crump Jones and a friend, railroad men, stopped by here. They, they joked that they wanted to marry rich widows. <laughs> well, Crump did just that. He married me. <laughs> and now he spends his time helping me collect my rents. Your brick store, it has now also been moved, Lizzie. And the new owner, Mr. Imami, was given one of those vintage calendar plates in tribute for saving that landmark building. Jesse Byram, come forth and tell us your story. You know, I think I married the nicest man in all of Tualatin, Joseph Byram, and the handsomest, too. I was just a little girl when I first saw him, and I remember thinking, Oh, the lucky woman he chooses for a wife. We were married in Twalton's first church, that little church with the spire and the stained glass windows. It burned down, sad to say. Some say it was set on fire by some rascally little boys. Then the first Methodist church was built in 1910. Rather plain, I'd say. But it burned down, too. Do you remember that? And now soon, we are going to have a new beautiful church. And this one will, be, will just be so beautiful. It's to be a charming style called Craftsman. And indeed, it will be built by the craftsmen in our town. And they'll build a pulpit in the pews, too. And I've been busy as a bee going around town asking for pledges of money and labor. Almost every morning after breakfast, I put on my hat and grab my shawl and head for the barn uh, where Joseph hitches up Queen to the wagon for me, and off I go. I've stopped at just about every house in the town around here. People see me coming, and they reach for their pens to sign the pledge book. They are as anxious as I am for this church to be completed. It will be stained brown, and we're already calling it 
the little brown church in the wildwood. Can't you just see that, the little brown church in the wildwood? I became very interested in photography when I was a little girl, and I have an awfully nice camera. I love to take pictures of the farm and of the horses and the buggies and of Joseph working with the team. We live in his parents' house on top of the hill, about a mile south of here. It's not just a farmhouse, but rather grand in its way. It has a separate parlor entrance, parlor entrance, and it's so refined when the preacher comes to call. Anyway, I have many pictures of our fine old home and lots of pictures of our little town. My favorite picture, though, is one of our three daughters riding the clod masher with their daddy behind dear old Queen. You know, thinking of our new church again, like I said, Joseph and I were married in that first church, and now I wonder, who will be the first to be married in our new church? There are two sequels to your story, Jesse. One sad, one happy. The sad one is that soon after the church was finished, you got very sick and died. And your funeral was the first one held from that church. But the happy signal, sequel, is that the church you worked so hard to create back in 1926 has been moved and transformed into the new Tualatin Heritage Center. And your photos, they are now in the Tualatin Historical Society's archives. Now we're going to have a treat from the Stites girls. <laughs> Just imagine that beautiful song being sung in any of our churches. Thank you, girls. Rosie Jurgens Castile, you've been around a long time. Paul, and come and talk to us about your work. All ten of us Jurgen kids went to school in the little red schoolhouse when we could be spared from our farm chores. My mother died when I was little, and I was sent to live with my dad's cousin and his wife. Lou and Mary Sagert on their farm. She taught me to keep house. I learned to bake, clean, sew, and scrub clothes on a washboard. I liked doing those chores. But you know, one day I asked her if I should grease the pie pan. I was making a pie, and she said to me, it's a poor pie that can't grease its own bottom. <laughs> I married Harvey Castile when I was 17, and though we brought six babies into the world, three of our dear children died and are buried in Winoma Cemetery. But we raised three fine daughters in our little house. It's halfway between a Methodist church and a school, a convenient location too, for the church, my house, and the school are where I do most of my work. I saw that church in Old Town burn down, you know, and I helped all I could when it was built in 1926. 
our little brown church in the Wildwood. I've always had a knack for getting things done. Had to, growing up. So I stepped up to organize church bazaars, quilting bees, my favorite. I guess you couldn't guess the number of quilts I've made. Church suppers and such. We do a lot of that at church. Guess I'm doing a good job. For the women, keep reelecting me president of the Ladies Aid Society. Going on 30 years now. Harvey and I also were janitors at the church for many, many years. Now the work I do at home isn't just housework. I was also a midwife. Only rarely was a doctor from Sherwood or Tigard brought in for a birth. And sometimes I think my birthing skills were better. But I was handy, and many times a worried husband would knock on the door and ask me to come help him with his, with his wife having a baby. I must have helped bring hundreds of sweet little babies into the world, including nine of my own grandchildren. And I also helped prepare bodies for burial, too. My friend here... Orpha Sagert and I started an early school lunch program. We made big kettles of vegetable soup in the little kitchen off the gym. The PTA ladies thought that hot soup helped the kids steady better when they had something warm in their bellies. Local farmers donated lots of potatoes and onions and other vegetables. Well, I became very active in the PTA and got parents to help with the lunch program, canning vegetables. We'd take the produce over to a public cannery and garden home where we'd pack the tins with beans or tomatoes or whatever, and the cannery would put the lids on, seal, and process. Those were big cans, too, like the size I use in restaurants. I remember one month, we canned 375 big cans of beans. That took a lot of people helping. You know, I never had much education, but I think I did the best I could for this little community. Rosie, you are one of those doers that every community needs. At your funeral, the, doc, the, the preacher called you the salt of the earth, and surely you were. Orpha Sagert, Orpha Allspa Sagert, come up here and tell us about your work in Tualatin. Well, I was in the first Tualatin High School graduating class. 1915 it was. I was president of the class and I organized a play called The Old Maids Convention. We not only had fun playing old maids, we raised funds for a piano for the high school with that play. I married Fred Sagert. Fred worked in his dad's threshing machine business and so did I. It was a custom service that moved from farm to farm, threshing and sacking grain, cutting and baling hay. My job was to hop in the car and go after the machine parts when needed. And I scheduled with the farmers when our threshers would come to each farm. And just as important, I'd arrange with the wives for the huge meals they need to have ready each noon to feed the crew. And to be sure, they had enough chairs and plates and forks. Now, a typical threshing crew has about eight men. And these men came to the house at noon hungry. They'd consume huge platters of fried chicken or baked ham, mashed potatoes and gravy. That was their favorite, mashed potatoes and gravy. Plus beans, pickles, applesauce, lots of fresh homemade bread, all topped up with apple and berry pies, and all washed down with gallons of milk and coffee. Now you cannot imagine how hot and dusty and noisy that work was out in the field and how hard those men worked. But by the end of the summer, the local farmers would have their barns all filled with hay and grain and straw, all ready to feed and bed their livestock through another year. That was a good feeling. Kept a good garden myself, of course. 
and canned hundreds of quarts of fruits and vegetables each summer. I had a house full of menfolk on my, uh, on my, of my own to feed. Fred and I had two sons, and when my sister died, we took in her two young boys, Wilbur and Homer Zuver, and their father, Earl. I've always been a strong worker. When I was young, I used to don men's bibbed overalls and a big straw, old straw hat and go weed onions out, in the Nyberg, with, out with the Nyberg girls, with their mother, too. You know, Ora Nyberg had 10 children and still worked in the fields. I never had much time for visiting, but sometimes I would give my neighbor Nettie Martinezzi a ride in my car when I saw her walking down the hill to the Oregon Electric train station. Each spring, she'd take her daffodils to, in to sell at the Yamhill Street Market in Portland. Well, Orpha, your work helped to make Tualatin a thriving farm community. And Nettie Martinezzi's daffodils, they now bloom each spring down at the Tualatin Heritage Center. Nellie Wish Elwert, you had a lot of responsibility and performed it well in Tualatin. Tell us about it. I grew up in a house just a block from two railway stations over in Old Town. Trains were blowing their whistles going in both directions all day long, but my favorite was a train that brought the golfers. They'd step off the Oregon Electric golf bags over their shoulders and head off over to the golf links. It wasn't long before I began following them to work as a caddy. I could earn 25 cents a day carrying a golfer's bag. I was strong and ambitious, so sometimes I'd carry two or three bags to earn more. Sometimes I caddied for Julius Meyer of Meyer and Frank stores. He liked how hard I worked, and when he heard how much I wanted to go to college, you know what he did? He passed his hat among those golfers some of them were pretty well off, and he came up with $500. He gave it to me and said, here you are, Nellie. Now get yourself a good education. I was so grateful. I used that to enroll in Oregon Agricultural College down in Corvallis, where I got a degree in business education. I married Fred Elwert. He was a local farmer. And I got a job teaching commercial arts at Tigard High School at $135 a month. That was in 1927. Fred and I had no children of our own, so I got in the habit of giving extra time and attention to some of my better students. I remembered how old Julius Meyer gave me a hand up and how that paid off. My students were good, too. They won some of the top prizes in the typing contests. Good for me meant typing 100 words a minute with no errors on a manual royal. That was a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> and I paved the way for many of them to get jobs in Portland firms and get into training positions. I had enough contacts with Portland businesses to do that. I got Yvonne Saarinen into an executive training program with U.S. Bank in Portland, and that led to a good job. But you're going to hear her story later. You know, I got the most joy out of giving people a leg up. I knew about the desperate men out of work. This was during the Depression. So I'd drive an old school bus down to Portland Skid Row over on Burnside. I told them they could get a dollar or two and all the food they could eat if they came out for a day of hard work on the farm and they were eager to work. I'd take them out, then I'd drive off to school to teach. You know, I taught commercial arts, but what I really tried to instill in these young people was a good, strong work ethic. You turned a lot of people into independent, hard workers who remember you fondly, Nellie. Thank you. B. Cole Henderman, where are you? Come and tell us all about your life in Tualatin. My family moved to Tualatin in 1906, when I was just two years old. My father was the head teamster for the Smith Sawmill. He had charge of their big barn, where they kept some 30 horses. I can remember when your brick store was going up, Lizzie, brick by brick. My dad hauled the bricks for that store from your brickyard, just a few blocks south. I loved going to school, and I loved my teachers, didn't you? I graduated from the old high school in 1922, and I decided that I was going to become a teacher. I attended normal school in Monmouth for a year, and then I got my first teaching job. 
a one-room schoolhouse out in the boonies. I carried the water, I swept the floor, I built the fire, and I taught all eight grades after walking a mile to school every day. I needed more credentials, so I started degree work at the University of Oregon. Then mom called me home to Tualatin. Dad had fallen ill, and I was needed back here. So home I came, and you know, I really enjoyed being back in my hometown. I loved seeing my old school chums, the Nyberg girls, Nellie back here, and others. And of course, singing in the choir in the Methodist Church. I got a job teaching fourth grade and physical education at the brand new Brick Elementary School. My goodness, that new Brick Elementary School was so upscale. A separate classroom for every grade. <laughs> that was a new experience for me. The old school that I went to had all 12 grades in four rooms. There was a grade school downstairs, a high school upstairs, and a little primary wing off the gym. Well, Tualatin was growing. In fact, the high schoolers now went to school in either Tigard or in Sherwood. You know, two of my high school classmates also became teachers, Pearl Yeager with me in Tualatin, and of course Nellie over at Tigard High School. I think I was a good teacher. I know I was a good disciplinarian. I was firm, but I was fair. Then three years later, I was named principal. That was very unusual for the time. But it was 1942, and men were in short supply. It was wartime. Eight years later, this old maid school teacher surprised her friends and family. I got married. <laughs> married the chairman of the school board, John Hinderman, and we live in his lovely home up a Meridian Road. Yes, B, you were a good teacher and a firm disciplinarian. There is one us, among us today <clears throat> who remembers being firmly shaken for only a misdemeanor. <laughs> Ethel Pennington, now you, in your quiet way, had a great deal to do. Oh, before Ethel, sit back down if you don't mind, Ethel, <laughs> because the Stites girls are going to tell us if they have any bananas. <laughs> yes, we have no I just know Nellie and B and some of these other women just love that song and could sing it too. Now, Ethel, forgive me, but you may come forward now. Well, this Grange Hall looks familiar to me. I've been a member of the Monona Grange ever since I can remember. My husband, Merrill, and I came to Tualatin in 1929. Bought a 160-acre farm south of here with lots of old-growth timber, which we which will come in handy as I will tell you. And now I'm Grange Master. The Grange was formed in Tualatin in 1895, when about everyone around here was a farmer. Their first meetings were upstairs in the old, over a store in Old Town. Then when that was closed, we met at the old school gym. When we heard that that was being torn down, I said, okay folks, it's time we had our own hall. First job was to raise money. We did it every which way. We had a hard times dance and charged everybody a dime. We gathered pledges. And I asked every member to do something extra to earn a dollar towards the fund. I told them I didn't care how they got it, just to put a dollar in the purse at the next meeting. I took the purse over to Citizens Bank in Sherwood, signed for a thousand dollar loan, and the work began. Our first job was to dig out the basement, and for that, the members hitched their horses to scrapers and dug out four feet of dirt. <laughs> Next was the lumber, and for that, Merrill looked at 30 acres on our place and got out the saw. He felled some saplings for posts. 
Check them out when you're downstairs. Those are what fold up this floor. And then he cleared some timber and had it cut into two by fours, all old growth. Merrill supervised the construction and says the posts and beams in this hall will last about forever. You know, the Grange was organized in 1867 by a fellow who was inspired by these words of Thomas Jefferson, a career in agriculture, tending the soil and producing food for the nation is the highest type of employment there is. Think about that. But the Grange isn't just about farming. This hall is also the center of social activity and is often filled to capacity with suppers, bazaars, plays, dances. This hardwood floor is wonderful for dancing. And music has always been important right from the start. One of the Grange's very first purchases over in Old Town was a breed organ. It cost $48.25. And those thirsty folks got their money back right away by renting it out to other organizations for a dollar a night. And we're still thrifty. When we dedicated this hall in 1940, it was totally paid for. Ethel, thank you for telling us about this beautiful hall. And aren't we enjoying it today? Nami Sasaki, you have a wonderful story to tell. I was a shy new bride of 19 when I came to Tualatin in 1939 and moved in with my husband Art and his parents. It was a big farm three miles south of town. I was put right to work growing berries, harvesting cordwood, and clearing land. We started a family. Our first child, Suzanne, was born in 1940. Then a year later came that December day when we heard the news from Pearl Harbor. Tens of thousands of us Japanese Americans had to leave our homes and go off to internment camps further inland. We had so little time to prepare for that, only weeks to pack only what we could carry. But we were lucky that our neighbors, the Michaels family, managed the farm for those three years. We were in Idaho and kept things intact. We had a place to come home to. Many families weren't so fortunate. The size of the farm has grown over the years since Arts folks bought it back in 1914. Now it's 100 acres. Additions were made to the tiny house to accommodate a family of seven. Our son Art and our daughter Joyce was born in the internment camp. We plant strawberries, rows and rows of strawberries. I picked these this morning. <laughs> Each June when the plants are red with berries, we're ready for the pickers. Managing the pickers, that's my job. Local youngsters, and you had to be at least 12 years old and no exceptions, walk, ride their bikes, or take our bus to come and put in a good day's work. I would hire as many as 125 kids over one season. My rules are firm. No stepping over the berries. If you have to go to a different row, you walk to the end of the row and go around. And no throwing berries, ever. <laughs> I have to be strict about rules, and sad to say I have to let some kids go who won't pay attention to that. And I certainly hope that doesn't include any of you. <laughs> Others tell me that they learn good working habits in their days in the strawberry fields. I've even been told that some have learned how to straddle a plant, bend straight over, and always wear a straw hat. <laughs> when the season ends, we're ready to celebrate. While we hand out paychecks, we also have a big picnic in our yard. We treat everyone to hot dogs and ice cream and all the strawberries that you can eat if you haven't grown sick of them. <laughs> Life has been good, so we build a larger house and let ourselves spend more time with landscaping. I've always admired the beauty and simplicity of native plants and the natural environment, so I choose plants, trees, shrubs, and place them to take advantage of the slight slope of the property and where the sun shines. Most of the plants were gifts and have interesting stories, 
the rocks were moved from other places on the property. A prized tree peony, the source for plants in the Oregon Garden and other national and international botanical gardens, came from Japan in someone's pocket. Mm. Lots of decisions and hard work, but it's work I love. Keeping it looking as good as new, that takes lots of work too. But when doing something you love, it isn't work at all. It's strawberry fields forever for some of us, Nami. And it's still a pleasure to drive past your beautifully landscaped home. And Martin Ezzy, what in the world did you do in Tualatin? <laughs> me, settle down to be a farmer's wife, gather eggs in my apron, <laughs> not me. <laughs> After I graduated from high school, I had a career as a journalist, wrote for several Oregon newspapers. I knew how to write a good story and meet a deadline. Then I got married. Guess who, too? A farmer from here in Tualatin. <laughs> so I got a job reporting for the Sherwood Valley News. I'd walk up to Jurgens Farm from our farm on Jurgens Road, catch a bus at six, to Six Corners, and walk into Sherwood to my desk at the news office. I also worked as a burner at the Portland Shipyards and um, on Swan Island. I got a couple of burns on my arms to remember that job by. In 1958, the Twalton Booster Club decided to start up the Crawfish Festival again. Lois Dalton over there, she asked me to write a history of the founding families of in, in, uh, Oregon, first, uh, Oregon Centennial Year. Well, this was the kind of story I wanted to write. Art, my husband, and I, we were really excited. He was born here in Twalton, as was his mother. He, they knew all the old, old families and their stories. So we interviewed the descendants of the early settlers, the Hedges, the Byrons, the Galbers, the Sagrets, the Nybergs, and they were eager to share their folklore. We looked through all family albums with them and found some great pictures to run with their stories. We went through the files at the old newspapers and information just kept popping up. When we talked to Clyde Hedges, he remembers that the Oregon Historical Society came out here in 1900, took a picture of old Isaac Ball, our first school teacher by the remains of the first little log schoolhouse. So I went to the society, I found that original picture, and I ran it with my story. Then in the evening, when all the chores were done and the supper dishes were washed, I'd set up my underwood on the kitchen table and weave together all the threads we had found. I organized the material into categories, the early roads and bridges, the first schools, coming of the railroad, the first businesses, and all the people involved. My articles were printed in the Tri-City News in 1959, one story a week. I got lots of calls and lots of compliments. Some said they saved the columns and scrapbooks, said it was like reading the history of Tualatin. I guess I could say it was the most satisfying job of my life. But I wonder if anybody remembers what I wrote. And that history you wrote was the basis for the Tualatin Historical Society. Without it, much of our history would have been lost. And now, let's hear from the Stites girls again. just remind you of the old times when people sang so much. Oh, that was wonderful. Lois Dalton, you have a remarkable story to tell. Come forward and tell us. Oh. 
Well, when Joe and I moved to Tualatin, we had four little grids. We looked for a place where the Bluebird and Cub Scout kids could meet. No, well, there's a park down by the river, we were told. Well, there was nothing there but briars and scotch broom. The city said it would be okay if we wanted to clean it up. So we started hacking our way through the brambles. That's when I learned that there used to be a crawfish festival here. The VFW folks put it on in the early 50s, but then the interest died out. And looking at the overgrown park, I could see why. So could we have the crawfish festival again? Well, the VFW wasn't interested anymore. So we got all the local clubs together and formed the Booster Club. Then we sent our kids out on their bikes to hand out bulletins, inviting people to a town meeting down at City Hall to see about restarting the Crawfish Festival. Well, the place was packed. We all got in and worked together and built what we needed, a picnic shelter to start and then a place to dance. At the earlier festivals, people used to dance in the streets. So we built a tennis court. <laughs> that way it would do double duty. We poured the cement at night. There were no overhead lights back then. So everyone pulled their cars in close and the men worked by the light of the headlights. The first revived festival was in 1959, the centennial year. And what a whopper it was. Governor Hatfield and his wife were there, and the Oregonian estimated a crowd of 5,000. There were floats, a parade with horses, and marching school bands. We even had a festival court, and Patty Jurgens was queen, Miss Pioneer, because she had the most pioneer ancestors. More events were added each year. Jason Hervin of the dog food plant sponsored dog shows. And Alpenrose Dairy brought their Shetland ponies for the kids to ride. And we didn't charge admission either. The festivals paid for themselves with the ads in the programs and the crawfish. Yes, the crawfish. We sold them for 75 cents a dozen, all locally caught. And that was a family operation. We'd go out in the evening, set our traps down by the river, and go back the next day and haul them up. Others would drop off gunny sacks full of crawfish they'd caught. We'd cook up a batch each evening, and Red Nyberg would take them over to Dickinson's cannery the next morning for freezing until a few days before the festival. Oh, the people loved those crawfish. It's thanks to you, Lois, that we now have a great Riverside Park and a locally famous crawfish festival. And now the park's picnic shelter may be named for you. Peggy Gensman, come forward and tell us about Tualatin. Oh, just a minute, Lois, Lois, you're right there. Wave your hand, there she oh, yes. is. There's Lois Dalton. <laughs> When my husband Lee and I moved to Tualatin, we thought this place looked just right to raise a family. The population was 300 people and that was 1954. I sold insurance and I did some odd jobs. So I decided to look around and see what the future looked like. They were building I-5 then, running it right through town on its way to Portland. And that meant one thing to me, the area was gonna grow and real estate was a good business to get into. So I got my realtor's license and I worked for Tigard Realty for a while. And in 1962, I set up shop. I fixed up an office in the summer's former house over on Nyberg, just about where the lake is now, and named my business Metro West Realty. That name just popped into my head one night. Well, I sold five houses the very first month. Then I sold the Jurgens estate on Tualatin Road, and that was 75 acres. The fellow I sold it to divided it into several hundred building lots, and that was Apache Bluff, Tualatin's first development. In the first 20 years of selling houses, the average house grew in size and in price from $30,000 to $150,000, but there was no shortage of buyers. They were eager. One California couple called me at 10 o'clock at night and wanted to go see a house. I had to show it to them with a flashlight because there was no power. They bought it on the spot. 
Metro West Realty was the only real estate office in Tualatin until the early 80s, and that was the time of fervent growth. When Tualatin became known as the fastest growing city in the fastest growing county in Oregon. Lee, my husband, was mayor during that time, and so that made me the first lady. <laughs> the city needed citizen volunteers to thrash out its growing problems. I served on the Architectural Review Board and the Core Area Parking District. Those both led to the Tualatin Business Association, and I was president of that. Not just work, though. It was fun, too. Once we hosted 150 guests for an association luau, and I served a pig roasted in an open pit. <laughs> I was president of the PTA a couple of times. With kids in school, I figured I needed to put my time in there, too. But each time I was president, I got pregnant. So I figured, better stop that. <laughs> well, that was back when they did uh, memorial, memorable fundraising school carnivals. Fundraising, they called it. I was the gypsy each year, and I read palms. Amazing how accurate I was. <laughs> The highlight I remember most was when the six of us moms, Corrine Baker, Clara Callahan, Jane Brown, Marion Von Heining, and Dorothea Pennington and I all did the can-can. That was a lot of high kicking as we imagined we were in a Parisian dance hall. Let's see. How did I do that? <laughs> That was fun. <laughs> you built a strong family business, Peggy, still growing strong after 50 years. And it sounds like you had a lot of fun doing it. Peggy Gansman, wave your hand. She's sitting right here in the front row. Every Pearson, every Pearson Andrews, <laughs> you have a special place in the hearts of many, many people in this community, children and their parents. Tell us about it. When I first stepped in to the Twalton Elementary School in 1966, it was as a student teacher, and I never left. 30 years later, I officially retired, but having continued as a substitute teacher, with 44 years and still counting. I was hired to teach first grade in what was then the only grade school in Tualatin and would be for another 13 years. In fact, Tualatin was just a one school district back then, one CJT. A split district, actually, the older youngsters went to Sherwood or Tigard High. There was no kindergarten yet, so this was the children's first experience in a classroom and I wanted to make them feel welcomed. So the night before the first day of school, I would phone each child to introduce myself, and we'd have a little talk about what to expect. I found it helped them be more eager and less anxious about the first day of school. Some of my fellow first grade teachers and I would visit each child's home for a conference for one of the grading periods. The children were always excited to have their teachers come to their homes, and some of them wanted us to see their bedrooms, which were always neat as a pin. <laughs> we found this was a good way to help the children, parents, and teachers feel comfortable with each other. First graders are a wonderful age to teach. We're, they're so eager to learn, and story writing each day was a given, and the children were often, you would use their own experiences to write their stories. The bulletin boards abounded with their work, and sometimes I'd hang their work on strings from the light fixtures in the middle of the room. Art, music, and PE were always priorities that enriched their lives, and it was always rewarding to see how the timid child in September would blossom into a confident, savvy youngster by June. I was privileged to receive some nice rewards myself. In 1984, I was named Oregon Teacher of the Year, I also received the first Krista McAuliffe Award for the state of Oregon. And in 1990, I was one of the six Oregon teachers presented with the Milken Family Foundation Educators Award of $25,000. 
When the school was vacated in June of 2004 and replaced by the new school up on Avery, I helped plan the reunion party. It was for all who had a connection with the school over its 65 years. Some 400 people attended and they really enjoyed it. They rekindled old friendships and enjoyed seeing all the pictures and memorabilia that we had posted in the gym, group by decades. Then it was time to bid our farewells to that wonderful old brick school. You were a much loved teacher, Evie, and it's easy to see why. Now it's time for a final farewell to the old school. It's scheduled to be demolished this spring, but the developer does plan to use the bricks. Althea Pratt Broom is also a very special to, to, person to Tualatin, and now we're going to hear her story. When my family came to Portland, we often went for drives out in the country. This was back in the 40s. The small town of Tualatin here was particularly attractive. Turn of the century houses lined the main street and a stream flowed behind them on its way to the river. The oldest house stood alone among the trees and when I first saw it, I thought this could be my dream house. Years later, I saw a for sale sign on the property. I called the owner, Dr. Harding, Maria, that was your grandson, and I bought it. It was pretty run down by then, uh, but what a jewel it was, or could be. Dr. Harding told me everything that he knew about the Sweeks, and I saved everything that had been the Sweeks. I found parts and pieces of furniture in the three attics, in the outhouses, the outbuildings, rather, and maybe the outhouses, and under the chicken house. And I saved old linens, some with Willowbrook embroidered on them. When I planted a garden, I'd find buried pieces of glass and pottery and metal that told the sweet history, and I saved them all. I spent lots of years cleaning, repairing, restoring, and furnishing the house. I wanted to make it look like it did when it was new and still make it livable for a young family with three daughters. And guess what? 20 years later, Sweek House was added to the National Registry of Historic Places. The setting is so rustic. Three and a half woodsy acres, Hedges Creek meanders through the property and Sweet Pond fills up each winter. The place is home to egrets and great blue herons, you can almost see from here, ducks and songbirds too. Not to mention a family of beavers, it's such a perfect wildlife habitat. So I became worried when Tualatin began a great spurt of industrial development on this west side of town. Would they pave over the stream bed and drive all the wildlife out? And then one day I saw Phil being pushed into the wetlands. No. Now I had spent time with the Army Corps of Engineers staff researching Native American life in the wetlands. And so I went to them for help. Meetings were called and many people came. We called our group the Friends of the Tualatin Wetlands. Finally, the governor and the attorney general mandated that 57 acres be placed in a protected area. Jack Broom later joined the group and it became a non-profit registered organization we named the Wetlands Conservancy. And now the wetlands are protected and the wild creatures are living well. And I don't know of any other place where you could be right in the middle of a city of 27,000 people 
and saunter along a path by a creek and hear nothing but songbirds. Now, I'm a teacher, and I've always worked to provide for creativity in the child's life. I had taught at the University of California's Summer Arts Campus, where I designed the children's arts program. And I had done workshops and seminars at Portland State and USC. And now I had the perfect place for an arts program here. For an, old, for an outdoor summer program where children could explore the arts and develop their human potential. And I named the program Willowbrook, the name that John and Maria Sweek had given to their new home. It began in 1982 with a group of 20 children and a staff of 10. And then with more and more children each summer, we moved it over to Browns Ferry Park, a perfect spot, woodsy, right by the river, but safely fenced. And now some 500 children spend six weeks each summer in the Willowbrook program, where they explore <coughs> drama, dance, music, creative writing, filmmaking, and the fine arts, and performing. We do everything from Hansel and Gretel to Willy Wonka and Shakespeare. Always a play or scenes by Shakespeare. What a joy, what a joy to see children explore their imaginations and their creativity. I've thanked God for all the years that he has given me to work with them. And now, and now let's hear from the Stites girls. <laughs> Let me see this just a minute. Let me see it just a minute. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you probably will. But that's <laughs> Thank you, ladies. That was so much fun. We've heard the stories of 14 earlier women who saw a need in Tualatin and went to work to do something about it. Women who made Tualatin stronger than it was before. And now we're going to hear from three women who are currently working in Tualatin. Yvonne, you're president of the Tualatin Historical Society. But what we want to know is what about your work with Tualatin when it was the fastest growing city in Tualatin, in Oregon? And, and besides that, what's that in your hand? Well, first of all, I must apologize for not wearing the uh, style of the 60s, 70s, and 80s when I was working for the city of Tualatin. First of all, I, I don't look good in mini skirts anymore. <laughs> and the spike heels hurt my feet. <laughs> And although I was a uh, closet women's liver in those times, <laughs> it's not possible for me to go braless. <laughs> <laughs> then or now. Yvonne, you were hired as the treasurer for the city in, in 1964. What was Twalton like then? And what is that thing in your hand? What is that? <laughs> I was actually elected as the city treasurer, and uh, the town was 300 then. My uh, campaign managers were my sisters, Yvette and Annette. I was barely uh, early 20s when it started. And uh, I was working in finance at the time. My uh, 
teacher, Nellie Elward, had placed me at U.S. National Bank as a work college student, so I had a little bit of finance behind me. When I started Tualatin, uh, like I said, Tualatin was 300. The city hall wasn't open. And upon election, I found the city was $28,000 in debt. The t city wells were going dry. There was no water in the summer on, on Galway Hill. The sewers were overflowing. And in fact, Life magazine erroneously showed Tualatin River is the most polluted stream in America, and it was flowing directly into the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> I-5 had been built then, but uh, most of the roads were simply market roads, some of them unpaved. But Yvonne, what's that thing in your hand? I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> there was one park downtown. The only industrial business in town was a Hervin Food Company. And the only economic development that we had was the sign on the side of the Hervin trucks going up and down the freeway. It said, Going to the dogs, toilet in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> now, Lois, this, this has uh, been a keepsake of mine for a number of years. My husband polished it up. This was the ball at the top of the flagpole. It's a toilet float. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to know. <laughs> a few years later, Yvonne, a few years later, you were named a city manager and judge. The first city manager, manager in Tualatin, the very first, and a woman to boot. Tell us how you sentenced young uh, traffic offenders in those days. Um, we had no police force then. We contracted with the uh, Washington County Sheriff's Department for 24-hour police protection, and uh, they were very anxious to cite people in court. So there was a need for a judge, and as usual with no experience, I was appointed as a... <laughs> <laughs> Be beside the uh, regular people in my court, the uh, Brothers Speed Outlaw Motorcycle Club, I had, had a number of um, young people coming into the court, and I knew, because I wasn't much older than them, that they wouldn't listen to their parents say, drive safely. So I decided that rather than spend my time talking to them, if they got their first ticket in Tualatin, I would sentence them to work at the Gresham Hospital emergency room. It turns out Gresham was a part of the Meridian Park hospital lines, but Meridian Park wasn't built then. So the kids would have to spend eight hours in the emergency room, and the emergency crew made them uh, actually help out blood and guts and sometimes death, sometimes not. And then they would have to write a story, a letter back to me and say what they learned. Uh, we checked on, the, on those people, and if they uh, didn't get another ticket in six months, we tore up and kept their record clean. And for five years, we noticed most of those kids didn't get another ticket. So it was featured in a national magazine at the time as pretty innovative to, to make kids become better drivers. Sure was, Yvonne. Uh, Tualatin was undergoing a tremendous surge of development in those years. How did you, as city manager, deal with some of those problems? The, the city, as I said, grew from 300 to 10,000 during the time I was working for the city. We also had two dynamic mayors, Mayor Lee Gensman, Peggy was fe featured earlier, and Mayor Brock. We had a dynamic city attorney uh, who always said, uh, okay, tell me what you want to do and I'll make it legal. <laughs> A, a top-rate Oregon engineering firm, CHUM Hill. They were our team. So first, we borrowed money to uh, to hook up to the Bull Run water system at, through the Lake Grove Water District, and we got water. Um, it so happens that when they turned on the water, all of the wa most of the water heaters in the city blew up because they hadn't had any pressure in them in years. Um, we also had about a thousand acres of uh, industrial land and started giving, uh, providing water lines to them. 
We applied for federal funds to build a tertiary treatment plant. That's three stages of treatment and not many in Oregon have it now. And um, Herb and Company gave us the land because they were in big sewage treatment problem too. Mm -hmm. We applied for federal funds to widen and, and pave the parks and we uh, the roads and we started planning on I-205. We established a downtown urban renewal area to eliminate blight and OMG did we have blight. <laughs> <laughs> You can see the rewards of it now, 30 some years later. We started getting developers to, to set aside land for parks and open space as they develop their land, and we applied for a lot of grants to buy more park land. Our idea was if we bought the park land and uh, uh, kept just to get as much land as we could, somebody else would come along and develop it in the future. And we recruited a major employer, the Meridian Park Hospital. Well, tell us how Meridian Park Hospital came to be located in Tualatin. Well, three Portland hospitals, Emmanuel, Physicians and Surgeons, and Metropolitan Hospitals, now um, Meridian Park Legacy, I don't know the formal name of it, they were looking for a site to build a new hospital on the southwest side. They had three sites planned on uh, I-5, and we wanted it. So we decided to go to, uh, for the economic development. The first day we met with the CEOs, and I hope some of you remember the old city hall that I'm talking about. The um, <laughs> three hospital CEOs met with us in, in the city hall. The door was open, it was kind of warm, and we were making good progress until old lady Breakbush came to pay her water bill. <laughs> she, she, she was a very vocal, old lady, <laughs> and at the bottom of the stairs she started cursing the city council and saying, those corrupt officials, those guys, they, they cheat everybody, they cheat on their wives, they do everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were devastated. So I, I went to the door to meet her and, and stood at the top of the door, and when she got uh, stairs, the, she got up to the top of the stairs, she was still yelling about those damn city council people. <laughs> And I said, hello, Mrs. Bush." She said, oh, hello, sweetie. She gave me a big <laughs> save by, <laughs> save by the bell. Um, it wasn't that easy to annex a hospital, though. We found out uh, we had a policy of not allowing water or sewer unless they were in the city. And the hospital site was in Clackamas County, out of the city and in Clackamas County. It took us two years to finally get that land annexed to the city and zone properly because we were opposed by the Tualatin Valley Homeowners Association, vigorously opposed by them. But over that period of time, we prevailed. They came in. They were the largest employer in Tualatin, and they still are today. Yvonne, the legacy of your good work continues. <laughs> Linda, <laughs> give her back the toilet book. Well, she's going to save that forever. Linda, <laughs> you are a woman of boundless energy. Uh, we want to know how that energy is transforming to Walletton, and it is. Thank you, and I will say this woman is a force to be reckoned with. Yes. We have called her back to work. She serves now in the Chamber's Economic Development Task Force, and we expect great things coming out of her. Well, about 18 months ago, I was recruited to take on the Chamber of Commerce, and I have to say it is the most amazing group of over 300 businesses that are dedicated to this economy to make sure that we are the greatest place to live, work, and play, that we have living wage jobs, that we have a vibrant exciting community that people want to come to and spend their money and hopefully stay. So over the last uh, 18 months, we've been taking on some new programs. We have a very active networking group because we all know once we get to know somebody, it's easy to recommend them. People like to do business with someone that they know, like, and trust. And so we, that's why we do our networking. We also do government advocacy on both the local, regional, national level, and even took on a controversial issue recently, which was very hard, but 
the business community felt it was important. Um, we do a lot of events, and we take our relationship with our nonprofit partners very seriously. Our goal is to make sure that our nonprofit partners are partnered with one of our businesses so that we can help the entire community to be a thriving place that you not only survive in, but you really do thrive in. Um, let's take a look here. Oh, there's a couple of things you may not realize that we put on. This last fall, we put on the first annual Corporal Matthew Lemke Memorial Scholarship Run. And um, we're very proud to have honored one of our fallen soldiers from this area and in turn created a scholarship that is going to help support a new high school senior going off to college this fall. So that was pretty fun. And having mentioned the Crawfish Festival a number of times, it is the Chamber of Commerce that today puts on the Crawfish Festival. This will be our 60th annual festival right this um, August 13th and 14th. And after listening to the history, it may only be our 59th. I need to do more research. <laughs> but it will be called Crawfish Fiesta. So get ready to don your sombrero and have a fiesta good time. <laughs> but before you were with the business community, Linda, uh, you provided some remarkable services for low-income people in Tualatin. Tell us about the food pantry. Um, I spent over 22 years with, in retail with Meyer and Frank, and when they went out of business, Lo and behold, I had to recreate myself. And the next thing I knew, the Reverend Wes Taylor from the Tualatin United Methodist Church, which you've heard mentioned many times up here, he grabbed me and he said, Linda, I've got an idea. We need your help. And um, those of you that know Reverend Wes, you don't, you don't say no. <laughs> you, you just follow the pattern. And so um, the Oregon Food Bank had contacted him and said, there's a tremendous need to serve hungry families in the Tualatin area. And I was stunned. I, I honestly didn't have any concept of what poverty was. So he pulled together six other churches, and we set about pulling together what is today called this Tualatin Schoolhouse Food Pantry. And it serves low-income families a box of food once a month. Well. From the moment we opened, our doors were filled. And I will say today, we're serving over 500 Tualatin families every single month. It's, um, it's an amazing effort of collaboration where it's individuals, the business community, civic organization, organizations, um, churches, everyone has pulled together to make this happen. Recently, we were about to lose our home because the old school was being sold, and a church stepped up to open their doors and Rolling Hills Community Church now is the home and has provided 5,000 square feet to the to the pantry. And so again, when a need has been, well, when something has been needed, this community has stepped up to fill it. And tell us about the medical and dental clinics you started. Uh, as we got to know our clients, we realized that, um, and I think you guys know this story really clearly, there is no access to health care or medical if you're a low-income family. It's not included in your work, you don't have insurance, and so therefore you have very few options. And at this end of Washington County, you had zero options. So in talking again to Reverend Wes, I'm like, do you know that people go to, the, to Legacy Meridian Park Hospital for a toothache? at nighttime when they're in severe pain because they cannot get any service. And he's like, yes, and it's expensive. You walk in the door of the hospital, it's $1,000. And they walk out with you know, some help medically, but they still have the toothache. It's not solving the problem. So he put me in touch with some people, and then they put me in touch with Medical um, Teams International and their mobile dental clinic. Well, there were a few obstacles you had to overcome. First, you had to have money. They wanted a check every time they came to visit the community. The second thing is you had to find your own dentist. Well, Reverend West put the word out, and uh, someone sitting right here in this, off this audience, George Bowlesby, stepped up and said, Linda, we will fund the first dental mobile. So we had our check. The second thing is we had to look for a dentist. And I called 15 dentists before we got our first yes, but we actually did. And now every single month that van comes to Tualatin and serves about 12 to 15 individuals who have no access to dental care. It's pretty amazing. And the program. medical clinic, is that sort of the same thing? Same story. We just started making phone calls and connected with the three hospitals, the Legacy System, Providence, and Kaiser, sat down. They put us in touch with the essential 
Health Clinic out of Hillsboro. And one year from the date we sat down, we opened the Essential Health Clinic over on Tigard, Highway 99 at the DHS offices. It opens up at night, so there's no additional expense, and all of the volunteers, well, that's just it. They're not paid, they're volunteers. So every Wednesday night from about 4.30 to 7.30, you can get access at least to free help. No, no expense to patients that walk in the door. That's wonderful. Linda, how have you responded to the problem of the homeless? And I know you have. Well, it, it's a, a problem that I would never have imagined being a part of. When I grew up, I grew up in a farm community. If you don't work, you don't eat. My mom was like, there are chores to get done. Let's do it. But what I realized in serving at the pantry is we're not all born with the same set of circumstances. Each of us comes into the world with different parents, different um, abilities, different mental capabilities. And we do have a situation where people end up homeless because we don't have services to provide for them. So um, working on this situation, trying to figure out, well, what could we do? We realized that when it got cold was probably when services were most needed. So two other women and myself sat down and we wrote, um, came up with a draft of an idea of um, opening our churches at night when the temperature dropped below 32 degrees, which is the most dangerous time. And I'll be darned if Washington County didn't not only agree with it, but embraced it. And they've taken on this program. And so now the entire county operates under this, this program called Severe Weather Shelter. And temperature drops below 32 degrees, we open the churches up, and at least people have a place to get out of the cold. So it's been awesome. Linda, your compassion and energy are benefiting Thank hundreds you. of people every day. You're precious. Now, Sherilyn. Sherilyn Lombos is our second woman city manager, and she's in the, currently our city manager, and we want her to tell how she deals with Tualatin now, such a bigger city and so many more problems. Thank you, Lois. So I have to start out much like Yvonne. It must be a city manager thing. I don't normally dress like this. In fact, I um, have a rule at City Hall, no jeans. And yet I, um, I'm a working mom, much like Yvonne was when she was a, um, a, the city manager. And I was out with my kids earlier this morning and was too late to go home and put on my spike shoes and skirts. So here I am as a working city manager mom. I like that. As the current city manager of Tualatin, I feel incredibly humbled to follow such a line of Tualatin women who have done amazing things. The transformation of Tualatin has been impressive through the years. As we've heard from Maria Sweek to Yvonne Addington, as the city manager today, I get the opportunity to have a hand in Tualatin's future transformation and in keeping Tualatin the special place it has been and is today. Tualatin has a strong group of elected officials who I get to work for who have a vision for the future of Tualatin. I run an organization that provides a diverse set of services to the Tualatin community, from police to library, streets, recreation, and parks. As a city manager, I get to be involved in a wide range of challenging community issues, from train horn noise, to congestion on our roads, to working with Linda and the business community. As a regional leader, I get to be involved in conversations about growth and regional development. Tualatin is actively planning for the future. When Yvonne was city manager, she mentioned that she put the first urban renewal district into place to help spur good development in our downtown. Today, we're working on continuing that urban renewal district that will allow the city to invest in the redevelopment of our community. Tualatin will be a very different place in 25 years than it is today. But the planning we do today, much like the planning these women did many years ago, and the investments we make today will shape what we look like into the future. We are involved in planning areas of future growth, out past the old coach farm and in the areas between us and Wilsonville. All of the pieces must come together in those areas in order to create something as special as we have today. Those pieces include the provision of water and sewer, new roads and zoning for the kind of development we want to see. The women we have heard from today laid the groundwork and helped make Tualatin the community it is today. As Tualatin's second woman city manager, and there have only been four in our history, I am honored to have a part in helping to connect the past, the present, and the future. And now you've heard what the 17 incredible women have done to shape Tualatin. They are women who saw a need and did something about it. They filled that need. Ladies, we are the... Ladies, 
We, we are, are the, the we, we are the we did it women. <laughs> now We did it, ladies, who uh, have pushed the rest of us so far it is to put on this thing today. I'd like to um, also, yes, if you will help me with that, um, uh, highlight Lois Martinazzi oh. and uh, Karen Lafke Nygaard. They created the Historical Society 26 years, 24 years ago, and have pushing, uh, been pushing us around to remember old Tualatin <laughs> for all those years. Like Lois's uh, husband who held the position that I have now uh, years ago, I didn't even know I liked Tualatin history until Lois told me I did. <laughs> And Karen spent 20 years in New York as an associate editor for a national school magazine and finally came home for a brief period and now comes up here all the way from Los Angeles to p just put on these productions. They're, they're both community activists of long time and we're so proud of them. So the flowers are for you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 